And welcome everyone to another Smart Money Circle episode. I'm Adam Sarhan. With me today is Joe Payne, who's the president and CEO of Arcturus RX, ticker symbol is ARCT. Joe, thank you so much for taking the time and welcome to the Smart Money Circle. Adam, it's good to be with you. Thanks for the time. So Joe, always like to begin. Can you please tell us your story and how you got to where you are today? Sure. Well, I, I'm a scientist, but I was also feeling entrepreneurial uh, back around 11, 12 years ago. And uh, uh, myself and Pad Chivakula, our, the co-founder of Arcturus, we, we thought that there was opportunities in the messenger RNA field and RNA uh, therapeutics in general. So we, we quit our jobs. Um, we took the risk. We didn't have a lot of money. We, we, it's an, uh, I'm, and when I mean entrepreneurial, I mean uh, nothing too ambitious. We started the company with just fifteen thousand dollars, so it, uh, uh, um, but it was everything we had. So uh, we 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 trusted in good science, and and uh, we made some exciting uh, innovations and discoveries early in the company's history, and we solved a, some of the, some significant challenges in the in the field of RNA and messenger RNA therapeutics, and. And that uh, that brings us to today, um, where it's we're now a publicly traded company, have hundreds of millions of dollars in the bank now, and just a really exciting uh, opportunities in different types of messenger RNA vaccines and therapeutics. So I look forward to to today's discussion. Thank you for the uh, feedback and congrats on the success story. I absolutely love it. I love uh, hearing success stories. So let's talk about the business. Please let us know what you do and some of your competitive advantages. Yeah, so Arcturus is a messenger RNA vaccines and therapeutics company. And uh, people now know what messenger RNA is because of the, the pandemic vaccines were you know, widely distributed. And so most people listening to this program now are, have been injected with messenger RNA and, and have experienced uh, what an mRNA vaccine can do. How we're different from others and the competitors in the space is we're bringing next generation technologies to the mRNA field. Uh, these exciting new and different uh, ways to design these mRNA molecules and to safely and effectively deliver them with new delivery technologies. These, these uh, nanoparticle delivery technologies are an exciting, innovative field and we're contributing to that. And then in manufacturing, this is not our our grandparents' aspirin anymore. These mRNA therapeutics are highly sophisticated, very large, highly charged molecules that are bundled up into these lipid nanoparticle delivery technologies and manufacturing these on scale uh, and taking into consideration stability and supply chain is all innovative. And we're playing a, a significant role there in innovating on manufacturing processes. But uh, if you take that all together, it's it's really a next generation mRNA technology and in, in, in an overall exciting new field. I love it. So next generation meaning different than the COVID pandemic type vaccines, or is that yeah. the next generation that you're speaking of? Yeah, more specifically, uh, we innovated significantly in the vaccine space. Uh, the pandemic vaccines did an outstanding job. Uh, they were quickly manufactured and distributed, but it utilized conventional messenger RNA, which is an older technology. Ours is what's called self-amplifying mRNA. And this has been shown in multiple phase three studies and published in, in high quality peer reviewed publications showcasing that self-amplifying mRNA is, is, uh, uh, has shown to be superior in many ways to conventional mRNA. And by superior, I mean higher antibodies. People want more antibodies after a vaccine injection that implies more protection. It's a broader spectrum of antibodies. People want a broader protective vaccine, especially with a changing virus like COVID or flu. They're always changing. So you want broader protection. And then you want extended protection. The self-amplifying mRNA technology has been shown to last longer. Uh, right now we're looking at you know comfortably once a year vaccinations to survive multiple uh, upswings or downswings of uh, and mutating viruses. So uh, people want a longer lasting vaccine. And then on top of that, uh, we do so at a much lower dose level. The self-amplifying mRNA is dosed at five micrograms instead of 30, 50, 60, 100 micrograms. So when you're injecting far less material, there's a local reactogenicity 
benefits potentially and other potential safety benefits as we uh, experience this product and more and increase our safety database. Any dose related toxicology, for example, is gonna be benefit from lowering the amount that you inject. So it's less RNA, less uh, excipients and other materials injected. So um, there's obvious benefits to that. Nice, and I know, well, please correct me if I'm wrong, but you focus on the orphan disease market and with a nanoparticle siRNA drug delivery system, is that correct? It's actually a, uh, an mRNA, uh, uh, it's a good question. Uh, in the therapeutic space, we differentiate with a delivery technology that we call Lunar. L-U-N-A-R is our registered trademark for our delivery technology. And it's different from what everybody else uses. It's chemically different. Uh, instead of using um, the lipids that were used in the pandemic vaccines, for example, we use a next, next generation uh, technology that is, these lipids are more biodegradable, which means after they're injected, they... Um, break down and clear from the body. And that's a good thing. And in the therapeutic space, uh, it's not just one administration, it's multiple administrations, whether you're inhaling messenger RNA or injecting it intravenously to the liver. The last thing you want is accumulation of these lipids over multiple treatments. You want the lipids to do their job, which de these delivery technologies to deliver the mRNA to the, the, the right cell and organ, um, and then after it does its job, it breaks down and clears rapidly. So we have a biodegradable technology and, and each of our lunar delivery technologies are optimized for a different cell type. Now for the non-biologists on this call, I think it's helpful to realize that there's 200 different types of cells in the body. That's a lot. We're good at three of them. And by good, I mean, we can deliver mRNA to uh, these hepatocytes in the liver effectively. We can do, uh, we can deliver uh, uh, mRNA to bronchial epithelial cells in the lungs, and then also myocytes, these muscle cells in the arm after a vaccine injection. So we've optimized our delivery technology for a specific cell type. And, and there's a lot of work and a lot of details in, in that statement, but that's what sets our delivery technology apart is it's biodegradable, non-accumulating, but also it's uh, uh, optimized for a specific purpose, a specific uh, cell type. Thank you for clarifying. So next question for you, is this, the next few questions, Joe, are going to be more broad in, in nature. Uh, let's talk about risk management. How do you handle risk and what are some mistakes you see people make with respect to risk management? Oh, with respect to risk management. Well, uh, biotech is inherently risky, so people kind of know what they're getting into when they start a biotech company or they they join a biotech company. Uh, so there's there's some standard uh, ways to mitigate risk. Number one is to have multiple irons in the fire. So Arcturus, we we started three franchises. We have a vaccine enterprise, a liver enterprise, and a lung enterprise. Not knowing at the time which of these, if all three of them work, fantastic. But uh, you, you want to make sure that at least something works. So having multiple shots on goal is something you hear frequently in, in biotech. So that's one way to mitigate risk. Uh, <clears throat> I guess the other way is to have backup programs behind your flagship program. Sometimes people can be too idealistic and think that their flagship program is going to um, just go all the way. But but there's always problems and challenges when you're innovate, invading first in class or first of its kind type of therapeutics. So having the appropriate backup strategy is also very important with risk mitigation. So multiple shots on goal and, and an appropriate backup strategy uh, is usually what's employed. And we're not unique there, but we, we employ both of those uh, risk mitigating strategies into Arcturus, into our pipeline. I love it. No, it makes perfect sense. So let's talk about timeless lessons you've learned along the way that you'd like to share with the audience, please. Timeless lessons. Uh, well, there. <laughs> that's a whole separate podcast for any entrepreneur that's listening, anyone who's done a startup company with just two people and limited money and runway. Uh, there's things you learn along the way. Along the way. Um, I think one of the timeless lessons is that optimism is very good, but idealism can be dangerous. 
So uh, when you're innovating and in a startup company, it's important to be positive, to have an energy of optimism that we're and take on challenges with positivity, right? But if you're an idealist, that can be dangerous. And sometimes uh, optimism can lead to idealism. And, and that's something I've learned to avoid. Um, I'm not an idealist, but I'm an optimist. And that's, that's the place that I, that's one of the, the lessons of starting a new company that's timeless. Uh, the concept of, of, of risk and entrepreneurship, the value of taking calculated and smart risks is, is, is something that I've learned and relearned again and again as you grow a company and as an entrepreneur and the value of, of taking smart risks. Um, but I could, I could go on um, the, the, the make, making sure that you bring people into your company that you can trust, uh, that, that, are, that are competent and likable is also something that are some of the timeless lessons that I've learned along this path. I love it. How about the other side of that, timeless mistakes? Oh, timeless mistakes. Um, <laughs> that's also a long podcast. Uh, you know, there's people that always ask, uh, hey, what would you do differently? And they say nothing. Uh, that's not my answer. There's a whole right. bunch of done differently. <laughs> okay. Uh, 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 oh, my goodness. Where to begin there? I, I think I think when when you're presented with something that uh, when you're presented with an opportunity to raise money, uh, I think I think one of the mistakes that people do is uh, this concept of beggars can't be choosers, right? We're always begging for money as in the biotech industry and 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 beggars can't be choosers. and i I think that's a mistake. I think there there you can conscientiously, make a choice to, to raise money uh, in a, a better way uh, from better groups, better people, um, that you, you can do that. You can choose who you approach uh, to, to beg for cash. It's not as simple as beggars can't be choosers and you just take, because there's always, uh, there's always certain elements tied to that cash, whether it's in a contract or egregious legal terms or, or the wrong people, the wrong group that aren't the best for the company. I think those mistakes I, I, I've learned through experience uh, uh, where to avoid and, and to pursue raising money from the right group, the right people, utilizing the right contract and legal terms to make sure it's best for the company. Love it. How about, oh, by the way, I, I love the fact that you said that there's a whole podcast dedicated to timeless lessons and timeless mistakes. <laughs> that speaks yeah. very, very true. So I appreciate you sharing some of them with us now. Uh, let's talk about leadership. What, is, what makes a great leader and what are some lessons that you've learned about leadership that you'd like to share with the audience? Yeah, well, it, 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 people may define a great leader differently. So let me start with what I think a great leader is. Uh, someone who is respected and someone who is likable right? That you, uh, and, and so let me dive into that a little bit. First on the respect side, I, I think a good leader is confident. They're good at what they do. And people always like a leader that knows what they're doing, right? Yeah. And, it's, and is good at what they do, uh, no matter what your auxiliary or what the director is or the manager, if they're good at what they do, they earn the respect of the people that work with them. But you need to combine that. You need to combine that with likability. And I define likability in a very uh, a corporate definition that's been proven, tested, and published on. And that's uh, led by humility, approachability, and positivity. So I think uh, uh, that's called the HAP principle, or HAP, if, if for those that are unfamiliar with it. And I think if a, a leader is competent at what he does, is good at it, but he's also humble, approachable, and positive, that makes a great leader. Got it. That uh, makes perfect sense. Thank you for that. I like that half principle. Uh, finally, let's talk about adversity. What are some obstacles you had to overcome in, across your path? How do you handle adversity? I know that's a big difference. I love what you said earlier about optimism versus idealism. So I'm curious to hear what you have to say with adversity. Well, I, I, I think it's a good segue from the half principle. Uh, adversity, a great leader doesn't avoid adversity at all. 
uh, th that's where the A part, uh, approachability, uh, approachability just doesn't mean, hey, hey, someone can walk in my office and talk to me about stuff uh, and be honest with me. And try, but approachability is also, I allow adversity to approach me. I'm not afraid of it. Uh, a great leader, in my view, the, the great leaders at Arcturus do not avoid adversity. So how you handle adversity is with humility, approachability, and positivity. So realizing the adversity may be my fault, um, that may be the organization's fault. That is a huge part of addressing and handling adversity, allowing it to hit instead of avoiding it, because if you avoid adversity, you're gonna be destined for failure. So you have to allow it to, to, to hit the organization or you individually as a leader. And then positivity is essential. People that look at adversity and complain about it or, um, or it's negative Bob or negative Nancy, they're just saying, oh, this is stupid. This, we'll never be able to do it. It's impossible. These sorts of negativity means you're gonna fail. But if you positively look at it, at like this is a challenge and we are up for this challenge, we can do it together or alone. Uh, we can we can do it. We can we can address this. So I, I just revert back to the hat principle when it comes to adversity to allow it to hit, approach it humbly and positively, and then that is going to be very good for your organization. Adversity always makes a great company. Always does. Yeah, I, I love that. And it reminds you of the book, The Power of Positive Thinking, which is uh, which speaks to that point. Yeah. So. Final Final question for you, Joe. What is the best piece of advice you'd like to give the audience or your 30-year-old self? Oh, my 30-year-old self? <laughs> okay. Um, what would I tell that guy? Uh, well, first of all, with respect to advice, there's a there's something that my father told me a long time ago that I that has just rang true in my life over and over again. And it's when in doubt, don't. But there's a flip side to that coin that when you don't, when you're not doubting, do. So uh, this concept of balancing, don't proceed in something if you, if, if, if you don't have the confidence to go forward. But if you think you're good at it, then do it. So if I went back to my 30-year-old, I'd be like, what are you waiting for? Do it. Believe in what you know you know what, what you know, <laughs> what you're good at. And do it. Don't just sit around waiting for someone to give you an opportunity. I, I'd, I'd be more proactive. And, and uh, But reverting back, when in doubt, don't. I think that's good. That's good advice. I love it. Well, Joe, thank you so much for taking the time. And uh, hopefully we'll have you on again soon. This has been fantastic. Yeah, thanks, Adam. It's good to be with you and look forward to connecting later at a later time.